Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to beautiful Northeast Iowa. And our latest edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on Iowa Outdoors. We paddle the latest rapids at Iowa's new whitewater parks. Blitz through the outdoor experience at White Rock Conservancy. Follow the paintbrush of award-winning Iowa artist Andrew Peters. And explore a trail in a minute. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. It's a journey that'll take you from here in Northeast Iowa to Western Iowa's Missouri River. But first, we'll venture along the rivers of Eastern Iowa to explore some trend-setting parks. When Charles City opened Iowa's first whitewater park in 2011, they started a new trend for our waterway-rich state turning a dangerous dam into a kayaking, tubing, and fishing mecca. In 2015, Manchester joined the action by transforming their local dam system into a whitewater park. After more than 100 years of generating power and milling grain, the Maquoketa River is now one of Iowa's great recreational attractions. The term river town is evolving. I grew up as a child in this town back in the 1960s and 70s, and back, uh, back then the river was really a place to be avoided. There, there were some trash dumps along the banks, high weeds. It was a place that your parents definitely did not want you as a child to be hanging out in. While still a huge part of a community's identity, Iowa cities like Manchester are starting to trade in their dams for recreation opportunities and gathering spaces transforming an unappealing remnant of the past to something entirely different. If you came here four years ago to see what we had going at this location, we basically had an old um, mill dam, and it was, uh, had not been used for generating power since probably the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. It's only been in the last five years that we've really put the big push on to turn this into a, a, a highlight of the town. Manchester found inspiration from its northern neighbor, Charles City, who in 2011 used a devastating flood to transform its community riverfront into the state's first whitewater park. Community improvement officials considered following Charles City's lead as not only a benefit to the town, but Northeast Iowa in general. We looked at how this will change our community, uh, how it will improve the river, how it will improve fishing and habitat here, how it will provide recreation for our residents and even draw people in. A lot of people bought into that. This is gonna be a really good thing for town. And only a few short years later, the Whitewater Park has done just that. New businesses have opened, aquatic life is flourishing, and recreation has skyrocketed. Paddlers, kayakers, and fishermen have flooded the riverbanks of Manchester taking everything the park has to offer and leaving only waves in their wake. One of the biggest champions of the town's efforts is Manchester native Hannah Ray J. Childs. As a well-known local paddler, Hannah and her peers used the success of the Charles City course to push her hometown to expand the state's whitewater offerings. We got our first one in Charles City. Uh, my good friend Ty Graham actually got that one off the ground and going, and he's like, you know, if Manchester is even thinking about doing anything in their town, he's like, we should do a whitewater park. And 
So when the Good to Great Committee formed and was like, we need to do something with the river, I was like, I know what we should do. So I brought him over and we pitched the idea to Manchester and they took it and ran with it. And now we have a whitewater park. With Manchester now in the game, Northeast Iowa has three parks for paddlers to choose from, including Charles City and El Cater. But what makes the Manchester Park special is all the different challenges it offers. It's six distinct features. Uh, each one of the little rapids is, is different at multiple levels too. The first one is like very big and splashy and powerful. And the next two are kind of like more beginner friendly. And then the next three are really stacked up against each other so it can test your skill level at multiple different water levels. There really is something for everybody, whether you've been paddling for years or it's your first time. Above the water, paddlers and fishermen are having the time of their lives. But the park was built with more than recreation in mind. Below the surface, fish are celebrating in their own way. Here in this part of the Makoka River, there's quite a few species. You know, it wouldn't be surprising to find, let's say, 50 species of fish or so. A project like this allows an opportunity to open up sections of the Makoka River and allow these fish once again to move through this area of the Makokoda. And so far they've seen nine species of fish move through this dam since it's been modified, something that wasn't happening before, so that's a pretty interesting thing from a fishery side of things. Dan Kirby, who also grew up in Manchester, personally misses the fishing spot the old dam provided, but says removing the dam actually improved aquatic habitat and offers multiple fishing avenues that simply didn't exist before. I mean, it's an improvement in my opinion because of how much attraction it gives to like families and other people that want to come fishing here. Um, it's just a real easy spot to go fishing on the river. I can say, go check out the Whitewater Park. It's pretty cool and most people are going to enjoy it and they probably can catch a fish too. One of the things I found very interesting is how people come down here and they just hang out and they talk to each other. It's just exciting to see that type of uh, community interaction that I'm sure it happens in other places, but it happens more here than it has in other areas. One of the reasons I was so for this project to begin with is not just for me and for the river, but also for the future generations. I have grandchildren growing up in this town. This gives them a golden opportunity to actually get out and enjoy nature, develop a respect for the river and uh, everything that it has to offer. And if the most visible water park visitors are any indication, Doug's hopes are being realized. I come up here about each weekend to either Charles City or Manchester City. We go do downriver races. We also just tube sometimes when we just want to go tubing, I guess. I gotta say it's one of my favorite things to do. With whitewater fun taking off in Iowa, other communities are starting to consider removing their own dams. Most noticeably, the Des Moines River, right in the heart of the capital. And if Manchester had any advice, it would be go for it. Well, I think they should take the plunge because it really does build the community as a whole. If you already have a river in it and you're willing to embrace it and get the people interested in it, it's gonna be better for the health of the river, the health of the town, not only for like the people in the community, but the wildlife that live in the river too. It was exciting to be part of it. It was fun. Uh, at times it was challenging, but uh, those, things those things come with all projects, but overall it was a great experience that uh, I'd do it again if we had a chance. I think every community has got to look at their community. They need to look at their dam and their river and how they use it. This type of thing may not make as much sense if it was outside of town a little bit and they didn't have all the great interaction with the businesses and everything right in this area. There's room for more because you, you don't really compete against each other. You're actually uh, partnered with each other. And if a person from out of state will come, They'll spend a week or two in an area where you have a half a dozen of these going from place to place to place. So in the end, it really brings in more people to the state. It's a great state economic development tool as well as local. As more water parks are established, the idea of what's possible on an Iowa River is changing, leaving a history of dams behind for a future of whitewater creativity. Uh, I don't know what they'll be doing 50 years or 100 years from now, but I bet you there's going to be fishing still. And if there's still water activities, they will be on it, they will be coming. Take a walk in nature and you're likely to see a variety of critters and plants along the way. At White Rock Conservancy near Coon Rapids, they preserve, protected, and restored a diverse landscape. Each year, scientists and the public come together for a day-long bio blitz. 
On a sunny, late spring day, new life and new discoveries are popping up across White Rock Conservancy. What do you think bugs are eating in this stream? Do you think some bugs are predators? Yeah, eating other bugs. Absolutely, they eat other bugs. Here, visitors are learning about stream insects. Have you guys ever heard of a mayfly? So this is a little mayfly larva, and he is swimming around like crazy right now. It's the right time of year to find mayfly larva, something these kids probably wouldn't search for or see on their own. If you were a bug here, you might get a lot more sun on you than if you were a bug in that little stream. Dr. Peter Levi of Drake University shares information about how these bugs live, what kind of environment they like, and he gets the kids thinking about what they're observing and why. See him? Put it in here. Oh, there he goes. Big. What is that? It's a. It's a is that a mayfly, mayfly as well? Yeah. It's so it's a, the same thing, just bigger. Big Everybody see that guy? That's a real big. Deal. So let's get him in water. So what have you found? What is um, a mayfly larva, I think, and a couple other things. I thought it'd be cool to like study bugs and look at them under microscopes and learn more about them. A series of workshops throughout the day give people a chance to explore new landscapes and ecosystems, learning about the environment around them and some of the animals, critters, and plants that call it home. So a true BioBlitz, your objective is to go out and identify as many new species as you can within a 24-hour period. And so uh, the former ecologist at White Rock, Elizabeth Hill, did that for a couple of years accumulated a huge species list and so we've kind of transitioned from a true bio blitz to more of an educational component so we do sessions and we get people out here to learn more. For a group of Boy Scouts it's a good opportunity to work on their merit badges and learning is made extra fun when you get to be outdoors studying hands-on. How will a boy know hey do I want to be a, you know uh, a, a reptile person when I grow up, if they have no chance to, you know, opportunity. If I, do I want to be a geologist if I've had no opportunity to do geology? So it's get our boys outdoors and the perfect uh, opportunity to meet with these experts in the field and, and you know, learn all this stuff, so. Nice catch, dude. Oh, oh, get him, get him. In the frog, snakes, and turtle session, hunting for them and capturing them is a challenge. But the kids learn how to identify species, and what makes each of them different, and how they're important to the environment. Yeah, they, they're very slippery. They're, they have very long legs. They lay their eggs in puddles like that because then they, most predators live in the lakes, and, and when the puddles dry up, the leopard frogs can just, the, they, they've grown by now, and they can just go into the lakes and fend for themselves. White Rock Conservancy is a large natural landscape of more than 5,000 acres near Coon Rapids. It's the third largest recreation area in the state. The diverse habitat supports a wide range of wildlife and plant life and an extensive trail system. You know, White Rock is different. White Rock is, it's, it's a museum. People here are recreating in an artifact of the past. The savannas that we're restoring and the prairies that we're restoring are what Iowa used to be. And so people come here and they look around and say, what, what am I seeing? And it takes them a while to understand. Um, but it's, they're always stunned. The mission focuses on conservation, sustainable agriculture, and public recreation. But education and outreach is important at White Rock, too. Every year I'm learning, learning things I didn't know or, or correcting things that I thought, you know, that aren't right. Um, it's a really dynamic place. I mean, you go out onto a prairie and not only will the prairie look different from week to week, but it'll look different from year to year, and it'll look different in you know over 20 years. You know, the prairies are always evolving. During a fish demonstration, John Olson of the Iowa DNR used a low voltage shock to stun fish in the Middle Raccoon River and make them easier to collect for identification. They also tried a large, old-fashioned net. Cooler temperatures and the high, fast-moving water were not ideal conditions for finding a large variety of fish species on this particular day. But even with only a few species of minnows, there was still plenty to learn. Okay, this is called a sand shiner. It's very common, common minnow. Yeah, it's kind of an attractive minnow, I think. The kids got out their nets again, and they learned about dragonflies and damselflies. I finally got a red one. Yes, you did. 
it took Very so good. much patience waiting yeah. there. Yeah, and that one when they is the female. Them. It is? Yeah. You okay. see the little spine back uh -huh, there? The yeah. positive? Yeah. They would capture one, identify it, record it, and then let it go. You scored every every dragonfly, damselfly that we've seen today. <laughs> Dragonflies can see in front of themselves, above, below, left, right, and behind, all at the same time. <laughs> so if you're trying to catch them, the best thing to do is swing from behind and below and come up through them because they've got that one blind spot. And we're just gonna pop this up a little bit to give you a little idea. You can actually just kind of hear it tearing yeah. Because there's so many, there's so much root mass in this. For some of the adults, a session studying the soil was eye-opening and helped them begin to connect the dots among various environmental concerns and hot-button issues like water quality. They compared the soil in a restored prairie and a cornfield. The real lesson to be learned there is that these roots help improve uh, and build organic matter in the soil and they also help the water to soak in. The day is full of information and learning. And whether or not the kids and adults remember it all, they have fun exploring this rural slice of history and connecting with nature. And they walk away with a greater appreciation of the natural world around them. To you know, have this area where you have the nature, it's not just a little puddle, it's a huge wide area that you can you know, walk for hours and still see something new. The different, you know, the different landscapes, the different uh, 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 forms, the different environments here are just, I mean, you know, it, it's a shame that more people don't know about this little jewel sitting up here. We don't want to be the best cup secret forever. We want people to come out and come out and explore White Rock. If you've ever been drawn to the majesty of the Mountain West, you may have something in common with one Iowa outdoorsman. Council Bluffs native Andrew Peters spent much of his life hiking to alpine lakes and horseback riding along the spine of the Rocky Mountains. But it was his childhood experiences near the Luss Hills that brought him and his award-winning artistic abilities back to Iowa. I was very attached to this area growing up. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the woods and I loved it. And, and my brothers and our friends, we were all out there and that's what we did. We sort of self-entertained in all the seasons. And dad took us hunting around Southwest Iowa and we, we uh, saw beautiful farmland and met the people that lived there. And so those, all of those things add up if you're an artist. I mean, if you got an artistic temperament, maybe you're just a hair more, you're sensitized. And I think maybe that's what happened a little bit. Well, number one is leaving home. You got to cross the threshold out your front door and, and either walk or drive to where you find inspiration. And it's important to not have preconceptions about what you might be looking for. Walking out his front door and exploring the world was something Andrew Peters did every day as a young boy along the Luss Hills in western Iowa. A childhood spent in the outdoors imprinted on him in a unique way. His days hunting, fishing, and hiking the hills and valleys near Council Bluffs later launched him into artistic endeavors after his time at Iowa State University. I, I was very lucky in that right at uh, within three weeks of graduating from Iowa State, I won the, the Iowa duck stamp competition. And in doing so, there was immediately a demand for the prints that were made from that original painting. There was fiscal value in those prints, enough so that I could set myself up for a freelance career. After graduating college, he traveled west in search of vistas for his own personal canvas. The multi-decade Western adventure of Andrew Peters had just begun. From Santa Fe in the southwest to the spine of the Rocky Mountains. Mesa Verde National Park or the Sonoran Desert or the Canadian Rockies. Or Peters National lived an outdoorsman's dream. I lived away from Iowa, roaming the west, living in four different states in the Intermountain West because Landscape painters are always looking over the hill at the, you know, at the next valley and the next valley. And so as a profession, you're constantly scrutinizing essentially all of the geography of the country. 
A lot of it in the early going in particular is very dramatic country, is very pristine sort of um, ca wall calendar looking kind of beauty. But in those years that I lived away, I would always come back each year where I had a studio on my parents' farm nearby. And I would spend at least a month there. I would go duck hunting and pheasant hunting with my dad and my brothers and my friends. And I would paint throughout this area and I was seeing this country in a new way. Indeed, I was kind of seeing it for the first time. And all along the way, his color palette and paintbrush in tow, Peters grew as an artist and developed his own style. My style, which has, which, which is straightforward, light infused, um, unembellished, unromanticized, because that is how I see nature. Uh, it is my, it, it's my legacy. So it, there is an imperative that I create something that first and foremost is true and honest. His flair for realist landscape painting reached a crescendo only a few years ago during a competition at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma. Peter's stunning work from the Lake of Glass in Rocky Mountain National Park won the museum's prestigious grand prize, a monumental achievement in the world of landscape painting and a touchstone to the career of a native Iowan. The Lake of Glass is the actual name of an alpine lake at Timberline in Rocky Mountain National Park, somewhere approaching 10,000 feet in elevation. Behind that lake is what's called a hanging glacier. Uh, it's the glacier that sort of feeds the lake, and it's called a hanging glacier because of the way it's sort of pasted into a calure in the mountainside beyond. And that is one of a, of a number of pristine lakes that are absolute ice age symbols today. Obviously with climate change, their glaciers are shrinking, but they are still extremely dramatic and among the most visited places in the national park system. After decades in the American West, Peters felt the call to return home, back to his roots, back to the Luss Hills of Iowa. He found a plot of land near Council Bluffs where he could be near his hometown with a robust outdoor experience in his backyard. This particular property is a section of Lust Bluff Hills that has a stand of bur native bur oaks on it. When it's after a rain, the prairie just takes on this really rich color, almost the color of a sugar maple. And that can be seen at many different times of the fall and the winter and the early spring, depending on the atmosphere. and. So it really lights up the landscape and it can still be seen in native patches up and down the river bluffs. His on-site workspace may be the most scenic maintenance shed turned art studio in the entire state. Decades of work across hundreds of vistas hang along the walls. The way that I keep a scene honest and straightforward and truly said is by making that sketch out of doors first and foremost. Near the pond outside, Peters has found a beautiful Iowa canvas to continue his craft amid the sights and sounds of nature. It's where his longtime artistic setup is on full display. He spent decades in the outdoors with an easel on the tailgate of a pickup truck or fixed to the rear of an ATV. What I like about it is it amplifies the mood. It takes everything in the landscape and turns it upside down and says it again in a new way with a new kind of movement. So whatever mood you're trying to convey, generally speaking, you know, the water is going to help you make that statement. And by working outdoors, you don't have to make anything up. All you have to do is be deeply involved with it and let it sort of inhabit you. Peter's mobile painting studio is where he often makes his first draft before finalizing the piece days later inside his studio. It's a craft he's honed for decades, everywhere from the Rocky Mountains to the Luss Hills, and a passion he's found room to continue back home in Iowa. So it's one of the rewards of moving up, you know, of, of figuring it out and developing your style. 
and it uh, makes a difference. It's time for IPTV's Trail in a Minute, where we'll show you a first-person view of a different Iowa hiking, biking, or water trail each episode. It's a great opportunity to relive a previous outdoor experience or to plan a future adventure. And it's a pretty cool way to view the Iowa outdoors. Take a look. If you're headed to Ledges State Park, the absolute must hike is wading through the refreshing waters of Pease Creek. Starting at the Archstone Bridge, the creek winds along Ledges Canyon, giving creek walkers a first-hand look at the picturesque bluffs Ledges is known for. No, it's not a traditional trail hike, but when it comes to creek walking, there is no better location in the state. As you come face to face with the bluffs, marvel at 4,000 year old rock formations and consider how many park visitors have made this same trek since the park opened 100 years ago. Creek walking is easily the most popular activity in the park. So on a warm day, be prepared to share the waterway with families and other outdoor adventurers. One thing to keep in mind is people aren't the only animals in the stream. So be prepared for encounters with fish, turtles, and yes, the occasional snake. After six tenths of a mile, Pease Creek lets out at the Des Moines River. If you've had enough, there's a convenient parking lot nearby. However, with such a short hike, why not do the same hike in reverse? That wraps up this episode of our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy Iowa's parks and recreational opportunities. If you're planning any outdoor travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. Our latest season of Iowa Outdoors will have more episodes than ever with extra stories from every corner of our state. We'll leave you now with some more images of Iowa's outdoor environments. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.